And we're live. All right, everyone. We have a very special guest today. His name is William Petter. And uh, so, William, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure thing, Alex. Uh, so my name is William. As Alex said, uh, these days I work at Xbox as a software engineer on Game Pass, which is our uh, sort of Netflix competitor where you pay a certain price and you get access to a bunch of uh, cool games to play. And um, let's see, I like uh, also like cooking, also like uh, music in my free time. And uh, I went to college at the University of Minnesota, uh, graduated about three years ago and have been working at Microsoft ever since. Wow, that's that, that's very impressive. Uh, and um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today, is it? Nope. <laughs> OK, uh, well, what I want to talk to you about is something that you did when you were 14. And uh, but before we get to that, um, let's rewind back. And can you tell us a little bit about kind of before 14 years old, when you were younger, how you got into computers and tech from that age? Yeah, sure thing. So um, I grew up in Minnesota, which um, for those of, you, those of you in Canada would not have that context, but there's sort of the coasts of the US, the West Coast, the East Coast, and then there's everything in between and everything in between sort of gets overlooked a lot. Um, so the town where I grew up in was uh, not a ton of people, um, not a ton of opportunities, a lot of space. Um, and so what we did have is a pretty decent sized garage. And um, so my dad, my dad had a lot of tools and he was an electrical engineer. And so I would go and I would just take random things apart. Um, most of the time I had permission, sometimes some of the times I didn't, um, but um, you know, got some tools from my grandpa, um, got some tools from my dad and I just sort of figured out um, from taking apart, you know, copiers and computers and mobile devices and stuff like that, trying to figure out how stuff works and trying to figure out, you know, what can I combine and what components can I extract and how can I make little simple, simple circuits and stuff like that. Um, and so it started with sort of that interest. Um, I was uh, interested in programming from about seven years old. Um, I made this game uh, sort of like pole, pole position, if any of you know any of those really old games where it's like a fake 3D graphic, fake fake racing game. Um, it was in Visual Basic 6, um, which is not a very good programming language. And I, re I recall my dad explaining to me that, William, you can't just have them all named like button 27 and rectangle 41. Like you need to give things names. And I, I didn't understand that concept at the time. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, sort of was hacking things together. I, I was... Um, if any of you know the Stack Exchange Network, I was a moderator on Ask Ubuntu, which is their uh, sort of Linux-focused Stack Exchange. And um, I was the youngest moderator by far from about 11 to 12 was when I was doing that. Um, and I remember not being able to sign a lot of user agreements because I was too young to say like, I'm, I'm over 13 years old. Um, and the people that were running the sites were always like, we've never had this problem before. We don't know what to do. Um, and so it was it was a lot of you know hanging out in uh, tech communities and just trying to learn, trying to sort of get my feet wet and trying to figure out. I, I've always been interested how stuff works and seeing that from the inside. Wow. So that's very that's very impressive. So uh, when you were a kid, you were taking things apart. Um, then you, you you developed a video game. You learned programming, and um, you were a moderator on Ask Ubuntu. Um, and all of this was before you were fourteen years old. So something happened though when you were fourteen. Given given that background, um, uh, what was that? Yeah, happy to talk about it. So uh, when I was 14 years old, um, there's a game called Minecraft, and some of you might be familiar with it. It is um, what they call a sandbox game, which is uh, interesting because it doesn't really have a point. Um, there are ways to quote unquote win the game. Unlike most games, you sort of get to choose what you want to do in it. Um, it, it provides a platform for you to you know, build things. You can play more of a competitive uh, way. You can fight monsters. There's a zillion different ways to play the game, and it sort of puts it in the hands of the player to decide what they want to do with that. Um, and it's been going since about 2012 or so. Um, 2010 to 2012 um, and um, even to this day it's a very very big game Microsoft actually owns um, Minecraft now they, they bought it out about six or so years years ago now um, and you know you can play it on PC and Xbox and all these platforms um, but uh, back when I started this project there was a relatively new version of Minecraft um, called a Minecraft pocket edition and um, up until that point, uh, you could really only play Minecraft on a computer or possibly on, a, on, a, on the Xbox 360. Um, playing it on, on a mobile device was like a new concept. Uh, mobile devices were still 
not terribly powerful yet. Um, so, you know, the, the graphics could use some work um, and all of that, but this was sort of your prototype. Um, this is what if we what if we put Minecraft on a, on a phone? And um, the team that worked on that was about three people um, and Mojang, so uh, not, not terribly large, but the game was pretty popular, you know, hundreds of millions of um, people that played this thing. And um, I had a friend uh, growing up throughout uh, elementary school, middle school, and then high, uh, high, high school. <clears throat> I guess this was late middle school when I started this, started this project. Um, uh, his name is Ethan. And uh, at that time, um, I'm, I'm sure some of you can relate growing up in restrictive households. There were like limits on how much time you can spend in front of a computer, in front of a screen. I think it was like 45 minutes or an hour or something like that. And naturally, I would find ways to skirt that. I would, um, you know, I would have a computer that I would take apart and put together in my room. I would like use cameras. I would use um, random devices, figure out how to install a kernel on them, figure out how to boot them up and figure out how to make them into a more general purpose computer. Um, and so for my purposes, having a Minecraft that could run on a machine that's not a full computer was really useful for uh, me having access to it on more devices. And so um, my friend and I, my, my friend Ethan, were like, wouldn't it be great if we could play um, competitive Minecraft uh, against each other on Minecraft Pocket Edition? And up until that point, um, no one had built that. Uh, it existed on the PC version of the game, and it was quite popular, I'd say. Um, you know, 20,000 people or so playing that at any, any given time on one of the larger servers. Um, they had established business models. They had hundreds of staff. Um, they were relatively large operations. Um, but on the mobile version of the game, no one was really paying attention to it yet. Um, and so uh, my friend Ethan and I worked with uh, this guy named, guy named Shoji in Spain. Uh, he was working on an open source project at the time um, to speak the protocol of this game and allow the clients to talk to each other. And we built something on top of that. Um, to let people compete in Minecraft Pocket Edition for the first time. Okay, so uh, you built a mobile version of uh, the multiplayer feature to be able to play this popular game named Minecraft, which a lot of people have played, and you were 14 years old. And um, your motivation to create this uh, at this point, because you were just 14, you were interested in tech, um, you just got together with some friends and you kind of said, wouldn't it be cool if we could play it and let's just try to figure this out. And your motivation was not to do anything big at first, kind of just, let's just have some fun and play with some friends. Um, but that's not how that worked out. Uh, was it? Precisely, precisely. Um, it started to grow pretty quickly. Um, we, we, we went from like a couple hundred players to a couple thousand players and it just sort of took off from there. What? Okay, so, uh, so so it it got to a couple of thousand players, and uh, what was that like uh, being fourteen? And um, what how did what did that feel like? And what happened next? It was it was pretty surreal um, because again, like the intention of this project wasn't let's go make something viral on the internet. The purpose of it, like, was I have this thing I want to use and I want to play and I want to do it with my friends. Um, and so let's just sort of build something that, that fits that box. And it turns out a, a lot of people wanted that, um, which which is neat. Um, when we initially hosted the server, it was on my friend's desktop in his basement. Um, it was just a little like you know it was whatever hardware that we had. It was whatever Comcast internet connection that we had. Um, and we very quickly took down all the networking hardware at his house, which is the sheer number of people that wanted to play this thing. And so um, within the first week, actually, of it launching, I, I went to my dad and I'm like, hey, dad, like I have this business idea um, for playing Minecraft on mobile and no one's done this yet. And I think it could be big. And um, he trusted me enough. Um, and I think he wanted to see me succeed enough that he he gave me a dollar amount. It was it was $16,000 was the amount of money he was willing to just sink um, into 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 this project, which is which is huge of him and very generous of him. Um, and so we took that money and we bought our first server, like our first in a data in a data center somewhere like this job of this machine is to host this Minecraft server. Um, and so with that, we were able to start to scale a little bit. Um, I think we were in the maybe 80 to 100 players playing at any given time. Um, and at that time, we were mostly focused on the gameplay. You know, how do you build out um, a map that's fun to play on? How do you build out um, an item generation system? How do you um, have things like a chat filter? I mean, when, when you when you start scaling up an um, online multiplayer server, you're going to have people that want to you know say stuff that you don't want kids to see. And so it's just like, we're solving these initial problems of, of getting this space running, and we're starting to scale it a little bit.
Okay, great. So uh, you're already growing at a rate that maybe you didn't anticipate, and uh, you've, you've encountered some small challenges, maybe small by what's coming next, which is, you know, your router went down. So you you got your, your dad, who was just really wonderful, that he was so supportive, and just said to you, okay, well, here's this... Uh, you know, let's see, let's see what you can do. Here, here's this uh, server you can get. And uh, now you are solving more technical challenges. You know, you're showing your commitment, you're building chat filters. Um, and uh, what happened next? Yeah, I'm, I'm really gr grateful for his support because realistically you can't launch a business under 18. All, all the laws, uh, there's a lot of very well-intentioned laws that prevent child exploitation and they also prevent you from starting a business um, pretty resolutely. Um, and so to do things like register a domain name or publish publish apps on the app store, you have to have a registered business. There's just no way around it um, for tax purposes and for everything else. And so um, we were sort of proxying all the stuff through his, through his business. Um, so yeah, so sort of once we had those first couple hundred players and, and things were things were going well and it's like, this is fun. Um, the next question is how many people in the world would really want to play this thing? Because with the um, the nature of online games is, um, you know, if it's fun, um, there's not really like a metric of how many people are trying to play this but can't get in because the server is over capacity or because, um, you know, if they try to join and there's no one there or whatever it is. So I um, started working on what we call a load balancer, um, which the, the job of a load balancer in software is to distribute traffic across multiple machines because at this point, this is too large for just one machine to, to handle the, the amount of traffic. Um, and that's a, a relatively novel problem to solve um, in this space. No one had, had done, done anything similar before. Um, on the PC version of Minecraft, you know, we can sort of look to, look to what was created there. How are they scaling? How are they solving this problem? Um, and they solved it by sort of writing something that redirects the traffic, um, like a little program that goes in a box and it sort of shoots it out um, to various directions. Um, that was all based off TCP. Our game was based off UDP. There, there were a bunch of complexities. We tried some software-based load balancers. I tried some scripts. And we got to like 2,000 players, but there was really nothing that solved the particular pro problem that we had of um, like game servers. Um, it needs to be low, low latency. Like um, the more latency you add to every network request is like as people are hitting each other, as people are you know trying to explore the map or whatever. It, it, it really um, it's annoying on on a on a, on a web-based application to sit there and look at like a loading spinner. But it's really really annoying if you're playing a game and you're expecting it to work in real time. Um, and so I started developing this load balancer that worked off DNS entries, um, which was really interesting. No one, no one that I knew of, and pro probably people have come up with, come up with this, this idea since, but it's certainly in the, in the game server space, it was new. Um, and the way that it worked is it looked at all of the servers as part of our fleet, and um, it sort of checked in with them to say like, how much load do you have? Um, and then it looked at the number of players that it, that it thought wanted to play by following, um, it, most, most of the players were in the US at that point. And so there's a slight curve of like, people come home from school, they start playing the game, they play into the evening, they go to bed, and, you know, it, it trails off. And so you have like this cyclic, cyclic curve. Um, and so you would sort of set a point on that curve that we wanted to target in terms of traffic, and it would add some risk to the rotation, remove them from the rotation, um, and update their weights as to how much it should um, sort of favor when a new player comes in, which server do you want to send them to. Um, and so all those things considered, we scaled up to a couple thousand players um, that were playing at any given time, um, like probably 50,000 or so registered players that we had, and of those, two to 3,000 were playing at any given time. Um, and this was like three or four months into the project, it was not, it was not long. Um, and it was, it was kind of shocking at that point to be like sitting in the lunchroom of my middle school cafeteria and my friend and I have laptops out and we are trying to run deploys and we're trying to, you know, SSH into these machines and figure out like, you know, why is the server under load or whatever it is. And we're just a couple of kids and we're hacking scripts together and we're figuring out how it works. Um, but it had already scaled to a lot of people want to play this. Uh could you just remind me one more time? So how many people were registered and how many people were now playing within a few months? That was, that was about 50,000 50, registered players and about two to 3,000 were playing at any, any, at any given time. Wow, so you have this thing, it's growing so fast and uh, you are encountering challenges with load balancing that it, it, it seems like you have to come up with innovative solutions where other people have not worked on this problem. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, since at this 
point you're like what 14 15 how are you able yeah. to find time to do this and kind of keep up with your were you keeping up with your grades at school were you going to school yeah i was going to school like this was back when like um people didn't really have computers in classrooms to take notes or whatever and so i convinced some of my teachers that i was taking notes and i was really writing scripts and like administering things during during the classes for the most part um i certainly didn't sleep a lot and i certainly all of my free time went to this project it, it took over pretty quickly just because um when you're trying to run a business that large with just a couple of teenagers um and we had, had to do everything from um just the scale of code that was required was huge um and it, it very quickly took over and you you so you're now also having to scale this uh th this thing um you you already talked about some of the uh some of the things that you did you talked about the uh, uh the the load balancing um um but but at this point you encountered even some more challenges um talk to us about that and kind of what did the scaling look like and how long did it take and kind of how you approach those problems from you know your experience and uh kind of the mistakes you made maybe and uh what you learned yeah sure thing so i think that um like i mean these days programming is still my job and so now, now i have a lot more context doing this for a lot more years um and i see a lot of over engineering i see a lot of people going into a project and they're like we are going to have um we're going to start with react and there's going to be like all these providers and there's going to be all these components and then like just to do the simplest app that's like a you know put stuff in a database is like hundreds of thousands of lines of code and um, we sort of had the opposite problem of we started with like here's the solving this problem and so every single piece of code that we were writing was to solve some immediate problem that was in front of us and um, I mean 14 15 years old you don't learn how to write distributed systems you don't learn um, like something interesting is some of the largest attacks on the internet in terms of um, it's called a, a DDoS attack is where you try to take someone's service down by just sending it a lot of traffic um, those have all been on Minecraft servers um, like the three biggest DDoS attacks in the internet have been trying to take Minecraft servers down um, and when you do a DDoS attack you do UDP traffic and our game is based off UDP traffic and so we had some really unique networking problems to solve um, Azure, and Azure and AWS and these other cloud services they were just starting to exist around the time that we were doing this um but they were mostly focused on web applications and so the latency was really bad and it didn't really support udp traffic terribly well like it was dropping a lot of packets and um we needed something called sticky sessions because in a normal web server traffic if a request comes in it's okay you just send it to any server and any server can process that request that's fine um in the game server situa situa situation if like different requests are coming in for a different user they have to keep going to the same server if you're sending them to different servers um the game can't work um and so we had some relatively unique problems in the space. Um, I'd say something that really prevented us from scaling was uh, we were building all of this in PHP. Um, PHP is a language that some of you might be familiar with. It's not terribly popular anymore. Um, PHP is a language that was built for people to hack things together. There are no types. Um, it's sort of a lot of people working on it on, on the open source project. And so a, a common complaint with PHP is there's no real convention when it comes to what functions are called. Like you'll have some functions that have like my underscore cool underscore function. You'll have other functions that are camel case. You'll have other functions that are like uppercase. Like there, there's literally no pattern. And it's, it's just because it's just a big open source project and people do what they need for whatever they're building. Um, and in our case, um, most PHP applications are pretty short-lived. Like a request comes in from the user, within 100 milliseconds, you render the page, you send it back. Um, but we were running a game server on the order of hours um, was was how long one of these processes, processes would run. And uh, when you are running a, uh, a website, it's okay to block the thread. Um, so um, some of you might be, might be familiar with in uh, multiprocessing as you as you scale applications and computers, um, you have this concept of like a thread is like a unit of work. It is like you're working on one thing at a time. And if you want to scale the application out further, you have to make more threads and you have to have ways for them to communicate. You have to have ways for um, scheduling and prioritization. It's it's a it's a complex instrument with com complex sort of things that um, that uh, that abstract the the details away. And for us, uh, we
we had this database and the database was um, how players, uh, how, how we were tracking like number of kills for like a leaderboard type thing. It was how we were, um, we had like this really simple login system where we would um, freeze the player player in one spot. We would not let them move until they typed in their password. Um, and so it was uh, just in the chat window. And there were definitely some bugs at some point where like the server would load up without the right initialization and then players would just dump their passwords into chat because that was our, like we, it was really, really hacked together. Um, and uh, like, I think the biggest thing that was preventing us from scaling at that point was actually the database. Um, we had this one MySQL database. Um, again, this was sort of before cloud stuff was really a thing. Um, these days, if you want to build a big scalable application, you go to Azure, you go to, you go to AWS and you're like, I want a big scalable database in a, in a box. I want like an event system in a box. And I mean, they charge you a lot of money for it, but you build with these tools and you can generally scale as far as you want. Um, we didn't have the luxury of any of that. We just sort of had the box that runs the database and you just throw more hardware at it and, until it can't keep up. Um, and so uh, when players were logging in, we were actually um, blocking the entire game server thread to go ask the database, hey, is this the right password for the user, and then come back. Um, and so once we scaled to enough players and once the database started to struggle a little bit, um, everyone would literally freeze as they were like walking around um, because the server was waiting on the database to do something, and that obviously does not work. Um, and so uh, PHP is not really designed to be multi-threaded because um, because your usual use case for this for this language is like a very short-lived thread that's like only a couple hundred milliseconds. It's not meant to run for hours. Um, and so um, I had to make some uh, contributions to a code base called pthread, which is um, what in C you use to to spawn threads. We they ported that to PHP. I made I made, I made some additions to it um, and sort of made like this async background worker that could go and queue up jobs and. And we made a REST API. Like up until that point, everything was just talking to the data database directly um, over an in, in, in internal network. Um, that was the other thing is like um, we had to maintain our own servers like physically. Like we, you couldn't. Um, game servers were too high bandwidth and too network intensive to really be hosting on a cloud provider. And so it was literally like calling up a data center. And I, I did tours of them of like, um, this is our data center in Texas, or this is our data center in Chicago. Um, and physically, this is, these are the game servers right here. Like you could put your hand on it and like that's what's running all of our machines. Um, and so we physically had an, an internal network. That was how we did the communication. And, and that doesn't scale to a point. So um, yeah, we sort of, we were, we were conquering these challenges and we were scaling to like the order of like eight to 10,000 people that were playing this at any given time, which is, which is huge. I mean, that was fantastic. And now we were starting to rack up server costs in the like two, three thousand dollars a month range. And we're, I'm kind of like, oh crap, okay, now we have to monetize this because it is becoming a serious cost to run these servers. Um, and so um, we, at that point, we were still just a couple of people. Um, it was myself and my friend Ethan. We had some volunteers to do things like maps, um, but the project wasn't revenue positive yet. So we couldn't hire anyone. And we were still just, a couple of guys and a couple thousand players that were playing at this at any given time we, it was we, we we were sort of very resource constrained um and so we commissioned this guy in india to um thank you thank you um to write this mobile app for us um to log into your account and to be able to buy a buy a virtual sword um the idea would be if you spend five bucks and then at the start of every match we give you this little wooden weapon or whatever it is and then you use that and you go and you, you fight other people and um it barely worked um i remember years later um someone mentioned to me on twitter a, a friend that's actually gone and find, found by vulnerabilities in ios i mean he's, he's incredibly prolific now but back at that back then we were in the minecraft scene um and he's like hey william uh, why does every single copy of your app ship this database of indian song lyrics and i went and i decompiled it myself and i'm like wait this guy just like dumped a 25 megabyte SQLite file into our app binary to make it look like he was doing more work um, because he didn't want the app to be too, too small, I guess. Um, so, so like from early on, we were really struggling to like hire people and to find people that could be competent enough to, with a, a team that small, to be productive enough to be worth it. Um, and so that went poorly enough that I learned enough iOS development and Android development to string something together. Um, yeah, Alex, you have, you have your your hand raised. Oh yeah, no, uh, no, you're just you're just saying so much uh, great stuff. I kind of want to uh, uh, break break it down a little bit. Uh, um, you, I want I, I had a point to make about this SQL database issue that you were describing. So, uh, is my understanding correct? The more you were scaling, every time that somebody um, logged in or uh, had to do something that interacted with the database you have, it was all running on one thread. 
Yep. It's like one process. And the more people you have still, you had like um the the game would just stop for everybody. Yep. And you went in and you kind of had to realize like, well, what does that mean? How do you fix it? So you went down the rabbit hole and you figured out, I guess, multi-threaded asynchronous uh, programming. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so uh, you, you solved that problem and now you had this uh, new asynchronous database backend. Yep. Okay. Uh, and and to, 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 build, to build off that point too, um, like I was desperate of like if we weren't revenue positive and we were already spending you know two three two three thousand month dollars a month on servers like we were going to run out of runway pretty quick like you only have that 16k it's like right. what my dad said is like he was willing to allocate for this project and uh, granted like when you show him like hey this is how many users we have this is how many player like it was hopeful but I, like all of us wanted to stick to that number and we don't want to like you know uh, uh rely on his good graces to um to because uh, it, was, it was very generous and so um i was trying to optimize and figure out how can we make better use of this hardware um and you would uh, attach what's called a profiler which um lets you look at a program as it's running and say like how much was each function called and how long did i take in each function um and they were pretty bad for php because people didn't usually build large-scale apps in php like we did um and i remember having to uh, rent from amazon a box with like 512 gigabytes of ram just so we could open the profiling file because it was so big because you would run the game server for like 10 minutes and you would say okay like what happened during that time like what was the game server spending its time on so you know we, we, were, we were learning how to build scalable efficient applications at 15 ish years old um to scale to the order of like thousands of people using it at any, any given time and the reason why the database became such a such an issue is because um every single server was talking to it and so you can't really scale the number of servers beyond a certain number because all of them are going to be having requests at some point and everyone is waiting for every every other one like you you need it to be uh you can't have things queuing up and be dependent on each other you have to have them be able to take place on their own so yeah yeah it, it sounds like you're solving at this point like really incredibly complex technical challenges and you're obviously building some amazing skills um but you mentioned also that uh at this point you were starting to worry a little bit about uh you know the monetization because you have you're having real world costs um yes. you have this loan and um Talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, so at this point, you're thinking, OK, we have these people who were working on solving technical challenges, trying to improve this, trying to keep this going. We have um, how many players at this point? Uh, yeah, about 50, 50 to 200,000. 50 to 200,000. Yeah. And this is at any given time. Uh, any given time, two, three, two, three thousand of them are playing. Um, Two to th okay, so you have fifty to two hundred thousand kind of registered Total players, registered but you players. have two thousand of them that are playing, and uh, and and now you're saying, okay, well, this is all great, but we're not going to be able to continue this thing because there's costs. We have to yep. pay for uh, servers, and now you have to come up with a strategy. So how did you approach that, and uh, what did you do? A lot of math. Um, so. Like the nice thing about how hacky our system was is it, it's very quick to get something out. Like it was very quick to let's do an experiment and roll some code out and test it. Um, and so we ran some numbers on in your average match. So the, the, our, our most popular game was like they call it the Hunger Games. Um, and if any of you have read the book or seen the movie, um, it's a very similar idea where um, you have a bunch of players in an arena. We started with 24. Um, and then um, you loot, you find items, and then you fight to the death. And um, the match takes maybe 10 minutes or so. And so there's one person at the end that killed all the, all the, all the other players and won. Um, and so our idea to sort of balance this game was um, you could go and you could find items in, in, in they call, they're, they're called chests. Um, you would go and you would loot the chest. And then we had some item generation code um, that I was already sort of playing around with because you don't want to make it too powerful because then it's going to be frustrating for the players because you're just going to spend all of your time getting killed by people that have better gear than you. And you don't want to make it too weak because then people aren't going to bother going and like looting the items or just going to start fighting each other. And so like you have to hit this optimal middle. And so because we knew roughly where that was, um, I started playing with 
um, okay, let's make some of the chests slightly better than other ones, and let's um, quantify how well do those players do versus other players, and let's get it to like where they're about like 15, 20% better than everyone else's. Like if they're given this particular set of items, they do a little bit better. Um, and that was important because when we eventually wanted to start charging for these things, we wanted to make it feel we wanted the players to be envious of the people that were paying money for the game. We, we, we wanted them to like, so, so it was, it was cosmetic. It was, it was a little bit of like psychology mind games. Like you want to see like, Oh, I, I want to have what they're having. Um, so like when the match would start, you, there was like 30 seconds of uh, everyone's just like stuck on their platforms while, while we're waiting for people to spawn in. So the, uh, imagine like a, like a circle um, and then people spawn in on the edge of the circle. You can look around, you can see everyone's names while you wait for the game to start. And then we count down and then like everyone, uh, a lot of people run towards the center because there was a lot of gear and loot in the center. And then other people would run out towards the edges and so forth. That was sort of like how the game started going. And, um so uh if you paid money for for the virtual sword we we had like two uh two things we were selling vip and vip plus was like a little wooden sword and a little stone sword and some basic armor and stuff um and uh at, at our initial initial our initial monetization model was not a monthly thing um I think I, I felt it was too exploitive to charge people per month. And I also felt it was a lot easier to say like, hey, mom, can I have $5 for a virtual sword? Like they're going to laugh at the kid, but at least like it's like a one time thing. Whereas like, can I have $3 a month for a virtual, virtual sword felt a bit, a bit worse, you know? Um, and so um, we, our idea was like in the mobile app, you would um, sign into the same account that you would play with the play on the game with. And then you uh, would you it would fire like the in-app purchase UI, and you would you know, would spend your five dollars, and then we would give you this sword at the beginning of every match, and everyone could see that you had it. Um, and we we balanced the game such that if you didn't spend money and you went and you looted the chests and you were good at the game, you could easily take out any of these players that were playing playing for money. Like we wanted to have it be only okay, but everyone that was paying money felt good about what they were getting. Everyone that was um, a free player that knew what they were doing felt good about like being able to win and everyone else in the middle we were sort of trying to trying to convince them that like hey you want to pay the money right and get the sword like uh, they were they were like our perspective perspective customers um and people still complained um i mean like any monetization model people are going to complain and, and and that was like something i was trying to internalize is like there's going to be no way that we are going to be able to like like we could just start like the most extreme monetization model is like we shut all the servers down and we say you have to pay to access it but everyone's going to hate that and there's going to be a lot of players that just can't afford because um there were a lot of our players in countries that just like the average income was really really low and um because in order to play the desktop version of Minecraft, you had like a, you had to have a full computer. Whereas in like we had a ton of players from Brazil, where like an Android device is super common, but no one has a PC for the most part over there. Like, a, but there's a ton of these like cheap Android devices that could run the game well enough that they wanted to play in our servers. And so, I, I would feel actively bad locking out huge portions of our community that were playing it because we had to come up with a monetization scheme. So this was sort of our our compromise. Um, and so we we got some help. We shipped those apps. We started selling the swords, and we got to fifty. 15.5k of the 16k that we spent like we got pretty dang close I, I was i was sweating i was pretty uncomfortable during that time i'm like man wouldn't it really suck to uh not be able to solve this um because we were only like eight months into the project or something like that um and like we would just have to shut things down because we couldn't make enough money and so like, when i finally started seeing those like seeing those dashboards on google play and um like the ios app store and like they're in the thousands of dollars range and it's like oh my god we did it like we're saved like we have at that point i was just focused on like having a couple more months like just being able to have the project keep going but i mean it ended up being sustainable so yep alex yeah, what really stood out to me about what you just said there was that uh, when you were talking about solving solving the technical challenges, I mean, you're kind of putting on your uh, your technical hat, your your engineering, kind of going back to you know when you were taking apart those printers or, but 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 now you're you're trying to solve a completely different challenge. How do you monetize it? And that required you to sort of because you yourself love video games. And you're playing the video game, so really that challenge you you exercise a completely different skill of of as a player, you didn't want to upset them, which kind of says a lot about you as a person. You didn't want to just you know like just start making a lot of money, and you know you wanted people to be happy, mm -hmm. um, and uh, in 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 some sense that gave you a really unique skill set um, that uh, allowed you to apply yourself to this kind of um, completely different problem 
Um, and 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 that really that really stood out to me. Um, and uh, you introduced them these swords. You thought about like, well, how would they ask their mom? Because you you could you, you were basically in those shoes where you probably were asking your parents for money. And um, so that to me that that's just really just fantastic. Um, so, but now you are you're growing to. Uh, you started monetizing it, um, and. Uh, Talk to us more about like kind of what happened next. So you're, you're monetizing it. And uh, also, I, I want to go back a little bit. You mentioned something about a, a, a DDoS attack. Um, and uh, there, there was something about, was that an issue that you were starting to face? Or um, what happened there? Yeah, that was more of something that we headed off with the architecture. And, and, and in terms of the gameplay, like the focus was always on like, is it fun? And we certainly made mistakes. Like there were things that I had to rebalance over time. There were th like, um, that's the nice thing about like uh, taking it, like you start with your intuition. You start with your intuition as like, okay, um, what are some more people in this space doing? Like, why does it work? Does it work for the space? Um, knowing our player base, knowing like, uh, yeah, like the asking your mom thing, but also like the knowing like where in the world are our players? Like, what is it like in their countries? Like, how do we make something that can sort of like, make as many people happy of the circle as you can. And um, I was pretty public on Twitter at the time, like, um, and to this day, I have like 40 something thousand Twitter followers, because um, like, I, I was giving updates about the servers and so forth, needed some more to do it. And um, I would get hate mail all the time of like, someone would be like, you know, at William, like, this sucks. I hate it. Like, you're, you're killing the gamers, you know, this is like, like, just all the time. Um, probably like 30% of the messages that I would get on a day-to-day -day basis were like complaining about the modernization model. Yeah. Probably um, a lot of them were older than you. They didn't even right, know that. Right, right. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and it's just funny because like people, it's like, it'd be like sent from my iPhone and it's like, dude, you're on like an $800 phone and you're complaining about a $5 one-time purchase. Like like it, just this, this mental block that people would have on like spending literally any money on the game that they play for, you know, hours a day was just like, and because and because I could see this, uh, oh, oh no, my monitor just went out. Um, I was just falling asleep. Okay, because um, uh, I, I could see the stats. I mean, I, I could see how long the average player was playing our games, and I I knew that like you're getting a lot of value out of this, and I know that it, it literally costs us money to run these servers. Like, there's no there's no way around that. But um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, so in terms of scaling, um, the DDoS thing was more of like a. It was we started off with trying to solve the traffic redirection problem for Minecraft Pocket Edition. Is like there wasn't a stable UDP load balancer on the market because um, like the, there's two main transport level protocols. Um, someone on, on, on this call said they were in, in, into networking. I'm, I'm sure that you, you know all of this, um, but TCP and UDP. TCP is a stream of packets where you have like a connection between a client and a server. And um, they sit there and they talk and everything is ordered and everything is guaranteed. It's like if a, if you lose a packet because networks are inherently unreliable. Um, and, and this was like a huge problem with us with like a lot of our players being countries away is like um, we had to deal with high packet loss and stuff like that. Um, and unreliable network network connections over there in general. Um, like you... Uh, uh, you slow everything like like if you lose a packet then you ask the client to resend it or you ask, ask the server to resend it and so forth um udp is unreliable by default in that like there is no persistent connection between the client and the server and it's very opportunistic of like i send a packet you send a packet there are no guarantees that the other party gets the packet um and so the creators of the game solved this by using a library called racknet which implements um pseudo guaranteed delivery and prioritization of messages on top of UDP, which is to me, it was kind of like, okay, just use TCP then. Um, but like, um, we sort of had to solve this unique problem for UDP. And in doing that, um, we never had a successful DDoS attack on the network. We never actually, like any time that we went down would be because um, I, I did a bad deploy or um, which, which certainly like even to this day, like if you work on live systems, it's kind of, it's unfortunate because everyone can see when you screw up. And um, I would, I, there were some parties that I would be in the back of the room, like trying to SSH into some server, like trying to patch something out because there was some issue with the game that, that was not, uh, that's just sort of the, the tragedy of working on a live service. Um, uh, and you can't really have unit tests cover things like how responsive is the game. I mean, it's, it's a complicated enough system that it's, it's, it's tough to, um, have good test coverage and stuff like that. So, um, but in terms of scaling, like once we solved the the monetization problem, uh, there were some small security stuff we had to solve. And, and by small, I mean it was complicated. Um, 
So we were running a game server on servers that were more tended towards web servers. Like I, I, I had a good relationship with our, our hosting provider. It was, it was, you know, I would call them like once every couple of weeks and we would talk about stuff and I would be like, okay, like I need a machine with like these specs and this SSD. And we, we were literally like pricing out hardware, like looking at Intel's website and the different ZN CPUs and saying, okay, like we're pretty single threaded, like we want high clock speeds and so forth. Like we were, we were negotiating that we were negotiating network bandwidth. We were doing, doing all the hosting type stuff you would usually do. Um, but nowhere in the cost equation for these machines could we really afford a uh, GPU. And um, for those of you that know something about hardware, um, games usually run on these different types of processors called GPUs, and they're really good at doing a lot of math really fast. Um, whereas CPUs, which is what we use for everything else, um, for you know, uh, uh, running your, rendering your browser and so forth, like they're not really good at doing a lot of math. And so, um, our servers didn't really have the compute resources to be doing too many physics calculations. Like they had to do some, like um, as a player is walking through space, you have to figure out like, where do they land? If they throw an item on the ground, you have to make it sit there and animate and, and if it's gonna fall off a cliff, like if it gets into a water stream, it has to carry itself down and so forth. And so a lot of optimizing the game and scaling it further was like optimizing these physics calculations. But we sort of hit this wall at some point where um, we can't really trust what the client is doing. Um, and in fact, from very, very early on, actually, um, the game did not ship with the ability to connect to external servers. That was something that people patched into the game. It was like it was a very simple patch that just said, like, instead of making the game think that you're playing with other people in the same room on, on your same network, um, make the make it think that the remote servers in the same room and then connect it that way. Um, the trouble is the application that you would use to install these hacks, these cheats, was the same application that you would use to install cheats like uh, let me fly or let me um, get any any item that you want into the game. Um, sort of in the same application that at least initially you had to use to connect to our server, you could also install these cheats that would let you do pretty much anything. Um, and from a fairness perspective, it was really annoying to have a couple of, and not many people figured this out, like maybe 3% of the player base knew about this stuff. Um, but every so often someone would just like come along flying in midair and you couldn't hit them and you couldn't do any damage and they'd be wearing full gear and they would just kill you instantly. And that felt really bad from a player perspective. There was no way around that. Um, and so we had to start doing calculations for like, is the player on the ground or not? And there's a lot of gameplay stuff you can do that means I'm jumping off of something or I'm on, um, the game had all these like uh, fences and slabs and half stairs and things like uh, Minecraft is organized in blocks. Um, like one, one unit is one blocks, but there are a lot of exceptions to that. Um, and having our server be knowledgeable enough about the game, but like the more complicated we made this, these physics checks, the more expensive that it was to run them computationally. Like we can't have the server be spending all of its time trying to figure out like, is this player cheating or not? Um, and the way, the way that we ultimately solved that was to bring our friend the database back in and say, um, instead of doing it over a short period of time, track what the player is doing over a matter of hours and um, sort of rotate who gets who gets their audit, who gets their physics check of like, if there's 60 players in the server, we'll be auditing like two or three of them at a time. And then we will save to the database sort of like a, a confidence score for like, how much do we think the player is cheating at this given moment? And then do that every couple of minutes. And if the answer is like over the period of like 10 minutes, we think that you're probably cheating, um, then we kick you out because number one, it saves us computational time from doing this all the time for all the players. Number two, it solves the problem of like, there's a lot of situations on the map where you could be on top of like a block or so in, in some situation where the server would think that you're cheating, but you're really not. Um, and so it makes it less sensitive. Um, Mark, it was the, the basis of the, of the server was this code base called Pocketmine, um, and it was specifically aimed at the mobile version of the game. Um, and so we couldn't load, we couldn't load any of the Java, Java plugins and it was all, all PHP, all PHP based and the, and the, and the API surface was, was pretty different too. Um, and so, yeah, so, so from a gameplay perspective, we sort of had to solve this cheating problem and, and, and that was how I ended up solving it. But, um, and from a performance perspective, the server always spent most of its time sending chunk data to players. Um, so like loading the map and, um, it, it had to gzip compress and it had to send it over the network. And that was inherently a very expensive operation. And so 
I was working on side projects. Like when you have a company that small, like um, the nice thing is if you have an idea, you can just sort of, you don't, you don't have to ask anyone's permission. You just go off and you start building it and you see how far you can get. Um, and so I was working on like out of process stuff to send the chunks on, on, a, on a different thread and we you know off offload the server for most of its load and so forth. We, we tried a lot of things, but um, ultimately we were able to scale up to like on the order of a couple tens of thousands of players that could play in any given time. Like I'd say we were up to about 26,000 or so at that stage. Um, and that was kind of surreal to me because once we once we made enough money and I started putting more servers online, I I really didn't know how many people in the world wanted to play this thing, um, because like the nature is, if you join it and it's not fun, you're just going to leave. If you join it and someone's hacking and you're not having fun, you're just going to leave. And so it's like, from a user perspective, there's no real like I mean these days just be like, are, are you enjoying this app? Rate it three to five stars, or whatever. We, it was it was more like sentiment of like what are my Twitter mentions like? What are people saying in the game chat? You know, it's 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 pretty fuzzy. Um, and sort of as we were solving these major problems and as we were scaling up the number of people, it was like, wow, a lot of people want to play this. Um, and it started bringing in a lot of money. Um, like we were on the orders of hundreds of thousands of dollars per month um, that the server network was bringing in, which was just pretty, pretty crazy. So you had 26,000 players at any given time mm -hmm. with hundreds of thousands of dollars per month in 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 revenue yep and, and millions, uh, millions registered this is when you were still at three employees or were you hiring people at this point we tried um like as i mentioned before with that one android app developer it was just hard to find people that were um that could function in a team that small and make meaningful contributions um like i think uh, a startup is a very different environment than a big tech company and a, a big tech company we move pretty slowly like we have specifications and we have design phases and we have permissions and we have approvals um with a company that small you just sort of do stuff um and it's just sort of like i need to be able to hand you like solve the leaderboard problem or like solve the mobile app problem and i, I don't have time to micromanage and to be terribly involved with the day-to-day -day. like I, I need to delegate and to trust you that you're going to do that um and so we tried to hire a couple people and it really didn't go terribly well um we were able to hire people on like the map design perspective and the game design perspective because it was a lot easier to find people that were competent and energized with like i want to make a fun game and it's like okay awesome like you know go and um build out a map that looks fun and um we were building out the types of game type game plays game types of games that you could play um at that point we had capture the flag we had survival games we had skyblock we had um the walls we had um and, and some of those had their oh oh, oh yeah I, sh I should definitely talk about this I, sh I should definitely talk about this so um this is sort of at the intersection of gameplay and technical knowledge um that was really a really fascinating problem to solve um something that you can't so so the game had a fixed world size of 256 blocks by 256 blocks was the mobile version of the game that was as big as the world could be and in in, in any direction um on the server side we hacked around this in pretty awful ways like for example when we needed to um, so you, you would spawn in a lobby and you could see other players walking around and you could choose what game you wanted to play. And then we would send the client a bunch of messages to unload the map around them. Like we would just sort of freeze them in one spot and we would say, no, 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 like whatever you think is around you now, what, whatever you think is around you now, it's actually this. And then we would just sort of replace the map around them is how we swap them into different levels um, we called them and so that was um, how you could have one server that was hosting like four games at, at a single time um, and you would just move people into different games and manage different games like that was that was how we how we solved it for the the multiplayer like uh, tournament style games um, when it came to regular old Minecraft um, one of the most popular ways that you play it is in, in a mode called survival mode and it's where you um, chop down trees and you mine blocks and you build houses and you uh, you oftentimes do it with your friends like you oftentimes do it with your friends to build a base together and to go exploring together it's just sort of like a, you all get in a call and, and you do this thing for fun um, with a fixed world size of 256 by 256 there's just not enough physical space for 60 players to be in there and to be having a good time like everyone is stepping on each other's toes all the time um, all the resources are gone pretty much immediately uh, and uh, you can never build something because someone else is just going to come and take it down um so in order to solve this um we took the terrain generator from the pc version of the game which is uh designed to be infinite in all directions um and my friend ethan and i made this like 
horribly complex system that would be running an instance of the PC server and an instance of the mobile server at the same time. And the PC server was essentially like the, the primary version of the map, like the, the source of truth is like, this is what the map looks like. And whenever the player would walk to like the edge of this 256 by 256 world, I would teleport them, I would wrap them around. So if you imagine a square, I can't do a square right now, but yeah, if you imagine a square, um, if I'm here, I would wrap you around here and then I would freeze you in place. And if we already had the train, I would just load it in. But if we didn't, I would go send a message to the PC server and I'd say, generate me a block this big. And then I would in real time, do the conversion from the PC format, like the PC world format, the way that it was storing its map to the mobile version and then load it in. And then like seamlessly, like you could just walk from one side to the other. Like it felt like magic. Like I remember when um, I was demoing this thing for the first time, because up until that point, like everyone just sort of took the fixed world size for granted is like, this is, this is how big the game is. And so we can't really scale this because of the number of players and all that. Um, and watching people like walk to the edge the first time and be like, it's, bigger like I, I i can just keep walking I, I can just keep going and and people people loved that uh we, we call it lifeboat infinity was, was the, the brand name of, of it um and i remember like seeing this screenshot that someone posted me on twitter because people would send me like when they were having fun in the games and fun stuff that they would do and it was a picture of like them and all of their friends and there was like 30 people on top of this like base that they built in the sky and it had like a bunch of farms and it had um like all the security stuff around it and i'm like that made it really fulfilling for me is like the reason that I'm doing this, the reason I'm building this is so that people can have fun with their friends and that people can meet people online. Um, two of the people that, uh, two people actually met in my server that ended up getting married and they flew out to Minneapolis to see me. Um, and they were like, um, so we, 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 you know, had lunch, had dinner and, um, that, that was just super surreal for me as like, I mean, I, and, and they were, they were older than I was. Um, but, uh, cause I was still probably 16 at the time. And so, uh, we were having these gameplays ideas and we were building it out but the focus was always on fun and the focus was like are we building fun experiences and the technical challenges were getting in the way but as i was getting more technically competent i could take on bigger and bigger things um we did like this walls tournament once where um i looked at like what they were doing in competitive esports um, league of legends csgo that type of thing and i'm like we, we, we could we could do something like that I, I can make a website where you sign up with your friends you sign up for a team we give you a time slot we um put you on like a skype call back then and we have you compete against other players and we do like an we do an elimination style bracket we get down to like you know and we have cameras and we have like a live stream and we have narration and voice you know uh, sort of uh, shout casting um so we, we were expanding in all these different directions and they were they were pretty vastly different in terms of like the skills that were needed and the um the code that was needed and so forth but it was it was all pretty fun um yeah this is just one of the most incredible stories i've ever heard uh thank you so much for for sharing all this there's just so much possible things you could, we could we could go into here and uh i just want to highlight some, something that's constantly standing out kind of throughout this um journey that you're taking us through is you're you're, you're constantly thinking on a higher level kind of why am i doing this I'm, I'm doing this for fun even initially you know you didn't set out to build this company you just just want to have some fun with your friends and now that it's there you're you're approaching it really seriously you're solving extremely challenging innovative technical problems but the fulfillment comes from you know people having fun and uh that's just something really in incredible about you and um i, I want to ask you a, a question that's maybe it's, it's not a technical question but i'm just kind of picturing uh you know six, a 16 year old who you know um goes to school and what was your schedule like? Were you going to school, coming home? Were you working on the weekends? What was your kind of social life like? And also, can you talk a little bit about the, your, your colleagues at this point who were working at this company? What was that atmosphere like? Were you kind of disagreeing, fighting? Were there like really dramatic times? Was it, or was it just all just this fun adventure? What was that like? Yeah, th those are some really, really good questions, Alex. Um, so so th th thank you for asking those. It's really insightful. Um, I'd say uh, when it came to living my normal life, going to school, it's like one of those superhero movies where it's like they don't know that I'm really. Um, and it was weird. It made it a lot harder to relate to other people because like when you want to talk about what did you do this weekend and it's like, well... I, I, I solved some, you know, load balancing problem, or whatever it is like, like, like it's, it's, it's not something that you can relate to other kids with. And, um, 
this project was eating up absolutely every single free hour that I could. I, I was probably spending like 60 to 80 hours a week, um, definitely all weekend time. Most of like, like a, a lot of the time that I would sleep and certainly every every evening was going towards doing something on this project. And I didn't feel pressured really until um, number one, we were starting to run close to that $16,000 limit. I'm like, okay, now I feel responsible for it. And I don't want it to die. And then when it started making money, I felt responsible for it because once something that I learned is like once something starts making money, people get really mad if it stops making money. And so I, um, I, I, I credit my dad a lot with um, giving us the initial investment um, and all of that. But there was an immense amount of stress of sort of like now that golden goose has started laying the eggs we expect it to keep laying the eggs and um there was an immense amount of pressure and i actually had to end up leaving the project i did that around 2017 i want to say um so i was on it for about three years um because it was like physically killing my body i was undergoing so much stress um like the human body is not meant to be going that hard all the time um 24 7 it is it's just not something you can sustain for as many years as i did it um and i had to leave the project because it was um it was just eating away at me i mean i i, I could not have a social life i could not do anything else i could not be a kid because it was all that i was doing and so i learned a lot and um there are a ton of really, really good things that came out of this project, but it was also sort of a a really formative moment for me to have to leave behind this thing that I had. It was A, how I sort of defined myself by that point. I mean, it was how everyone knew me. Um, it was by far the most complex thing I had built in my life, um, and yet it was damaging um, me to a point where I couldn't keep doing it indefinitely. So that's the uh, the the answer for the the, the social life one and um, the, the everything else. Um, you asked one more question. Um, I'm trying to remember oh, just, what was. Uh, your, what was the atmosphere like with your colleagues and, um, yeah, absolutely. I'd say that there, there was some tension, uh, with my dad, especially when it came to money. Like, I think that he wanted the monetization to be a lot more aggressive than it was. And it's sort of impossible. We went back and forth and I, I think it's good to have people that have different perspectives than you do because, if my primary focus was on like on having it be fun for the player, you need someone that's going to come in and be like, but yeah, but how much money can we squeeze out of it? And I, th I think you need both voices in the room. Um, but there was definitely some contention over like what was acceptable um, and sort of how far I was willing to go. And I'd say the biggest moment of contention actually wasn't with us. It was with the company that makes the game. So um, Mojang is the company that, that built Minecraft. And what was really weird is we were doing all of this really without supervision from them and without a ton of acceptance from them. Like the person that made the server software initially that we were working with um, that had the most code contributions, he ended up going to work for Mo Mojang. Um, and so I had like a guy that I knew there and I had a guy like some, they would push updates to the game and sometimes they would do something so horrible in the protocol that I would have to call him up and I'd be like, Shoji, like, I, I, I can't deal with this. Like, like you're just DDoSing our server with packets or like you like completely messed up like this, like very core game mechanic and we, we can't patch around it. And so like, I, I sort of had that as like my last resort and I tried not to use it too often, but besides that, there was not really like a lot of acknowledgement from that company of what we were doing, which was really weird because at that point, um, when people bought this game, a lot of it was because of our servers. Um, like on YouTube, the number of people that would make videos on our servers in particular was absolutely huge. Um, there were channels that had um, tens of millions of subscribers um, that would do series where they would, you know, try to use like only one type of weapon or they would be with their friends and they would make like a little skit out of it or whatever it was. Uh, we we tried to support that by, by make, making maps that had like, you know, sort of almost like a set for a play, like have locations that you could you could go and you could build into a story. Um, so there was this massive, massive community around the server happening at this point, and we had very little acknowledgement from the actual people that made the game, which was deeply, deeply weird. Um, it is deeply weird to be building something for someone else's product and to not have it be, to have this like elephant in the room and to not have a real working relationship with them. Um, there was a moment in time where it was right before Microsoft acqu acquired Minecraft, um, that they impose a new EULA for the game, um, a, a, a new like terms of terms of service that you have to agree to before you start playing the game. And um, one of the terms of uh, one of the terms of that agreement was that you couldn't charge players, you couldn't make people pay money for any gameplay advantage of any type. Um, that was one of the conditions. Um, and I think 
it was because there were some servers on the desktop version of the game that were getting pretty egregious with their monetization. And that was something that I was proud of us. I think that differentiated us even from like other peers in, in the, the mobile space um, was the focus was always on like, is the game fun? And if the game is fun and if we're making enough money to sustain it, then like my goal is not to squeeze as much of the, of, out of this as possible. Like we'll, we'll do what we have to along the way, but like that should be the focus. Whereas there were definitely some servers where it was very like microtransaction oriented and it was very, um, uh, to this day, I think that there's a lot of mobile games that have realized that kids are really susceptible to um, the dopamine that you get from certain actions. And there's been like all these new stories of, you know, kids spending $10,000 on Candy Crush, or whatever, like there are developers out there that know how exploitable that cycle is. And I think the intention of this rule change was to not not want Minecraft to be associated with stuff like that, which is which is totally valid and totally it makes sense. From our perspective, um, sort of over here in the corner, we we were the, we were the biggest server by far um, in terms of number of players. Like the next one was maybe doing a thousand at any, any given time. Like it was it was nowhere close to us. We were we were cleaning up on the on the the mobile space um, and uh, like. Uh, it was now clear that like up until that point, the company had not acknowledged what we were doing. And now that they had started acknowledging it, they sort of came with this decree of like, stop charging players money for swords. Like you can't do that. Um, and I was sort of freaking out because how do you build a monetization model that does not charge people for any sort of gameplay thing when that's sort of the, the basis of like balancing the game was making this like slight advantage and tuning that. Um, I didn't want to charge for access. I didn't want to, um, like you can do purely cosmetic stuff. Like what Fortnite does, it's like a, 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 a lot of what their, their gameplay advantages are, are purely like, you know, fun sounds and like wonky looking weapons and like suits and stuff. But Minecraft is not a game that's flexible enough to really allow you to do that much in that way. Like we, you have a certain number of items and blocks and, and, we had some leeway and, and we we tried i mean bl believe me we tried to make all sorts of wacky effects and but people weren't buying them because they aren't fun um it's it's sort of like when you buy your virtual sword you, you feel powerful you feel fun when you buy this effect you just sort of feel like someone that spent money on a game that's free and that doesn't feel good like it's um so i'd say the biggest moment of tension was not actually within the company it was um with microsoft and with mojang when when that was going down um, and, um, the, the second biggest was like when I decided to leave the project, um, with, with my dad, um, it, it did not go over well. Um, and, um, I was still living at home at the time. And so even after I left the project, uh, he was constantly threatening to shut, shut the thing down. Um, and I know that he didn't want to do that because of how much money that it was making. Like it was, it, it was funny cause like his company built, um, burglar deterrent devices and um, like optical sensors for rain and like these, these very specific hardware projects. They had never done anything software up, up until that point. And this project was already bringing in more money than um, all those other hardware adventures combined, which he had been doing for like 25, 30 years. I mean, it was it was that big. The nice thing about software is like once it starts making money, you can just keep scaling it. I, I think our best month, we did $700,000 and that was December of like 2017. Um, which is insane. I mean, that, that, that is an absolutely staggering amount of money. Um, and so, um, after I left, because I mean, I, I, I really, I was making a lot of noise for a while of like, Hey, it's not sustainable to have two teenage, two teenagers be like bearing, bearing the weight of this absolutely massive project. Um, and I think I sort of had to quit to sort of like make that message known of like, like this is, um, I, I had done everything that I could up until that point. Um, and because I was still living in the same house as my dad, like there was a lot of, I think because he knew that I still cared about the project, he would try to sort of get information out of me and try to make me feel guilty and, um, like bring it up at the dinner table constantly and stuff like that. So that was just a, in terms of tension, that's what I think of is like, after I left, dear God, was it awful. Um, and it was sort of like, uh, I still had this drive to build things. So I ended up building up, uh, I ended up building this music community site. I ended up building this, um, mobile card game app. Like I, I was still pouring that development energy into, into different projects, but it was because I sort of had to satisfy this urge and not because I wanted to, um, so yeah. So when I, when I think of tension, it's mostly around leaving the project. Um, that was, that was the biggest thing. And, and the EULA change was also pretty bad. Um, so something I want to highlight once again is that um, you you kept a, you have you, you had a very strong character from the beginning of you had a 
clear sense of you wanted to do this for fun. Um, when the EULA changed, um, you understood that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't fit into kind of the, the human side of the way that you see that these games should be played. You were concerned with, you know, um, kids getting charged all of this money. And uh, there were even times, because I guess the, the company was under your your dad as far as like the actual ownership because you were under under age. Yep. And uh, as a result of that, uh, even uh, he had his own ideas about the monetization. But uh, what, I, what, what I really admire about what you're saying here is that you're, you had a strong enough character to say, no, um, this is not right. This is what I believe in. And, uh, and also, I can imagine being at that age, I mean, you're essentially um, thwarted yourself into adulthood with all of this responsibility. Um, all of this money, the pressure must have been tremendous. Meanwhile, like you, you also have to go to school, which is like really kind of what most kids, the only thing they care about is going to school. And um, you had the, uh, the grit to go through it all and be able to, at this point, you had the, such a complex project with uh, not, not only all of these things to worry about, but you had now family tensions, and now you had um, uh, people to manage, but at the same time, what I really admire is you, you You looked at everything now with the changing of the EULA and all of these different factors, and you decided at the same time, I'm still a teenager who wants, you know, like to experience probably like a social life and things like that. And you put all of that together and you kind of quit. Um, so uh, that that's really just so uh, notable to hear. And uh, I guess what I want to... Uh, um, know about because you you mentioned a few times about how you left the project is um tell us uh towards the end of when you left the project how big the project grew and also um i wanted you to maybe go into the details uh i know you mentioned it to me before but you you had some kind of a, attack that happened on your server as well um yeah the, the um, password thing i'm, I'm and uh that. yeah and, and and after that i guess i just want to ask you some questions kind of what you did after you left the project yeah sure thing sure thing um uh by the time that i left we were doing about 52 to fifty six thousand concurrent players and we had about 26 million registered players um which is bonkers i mean th th those are numbers that are just like i i never would have guessed that it would have grown that big it, it was it was absolutely silly um to be you know 16 at the time and to be like the responsibility is really what gets you. It's like I was stuck between this rock and a hard place where I, it's my dad on one side, it's 26 million players on the other side, it's a company that's being acquired on, on my, by Microsoft on the third side, and then there's just me. And I feel like all this is in public. Like it's really, really weird to be every decision that you make is going to be so far impacting and people are going to be so vocal about what they think about it. I mean, like I, I if, and I, and I, there's plenty of times that I screwed up and there's plenty of times where like I, um, did something that I regret from like a gameplay perspective or from a management perspective. Um, there's, there's certainly lessons that I would learn. Um, but building an online business, you are very, very, very much in public. And so to have to make this very personal decision, um, very, extreme decision um there there I, I don't think that there was ever any like way of me getting out of that project that was not extreme because it was really extreme when i got into it and it was sort of all focused around myself and my friend um and my my, my friend didn't quit by the way like he um i think without him it would have absolutely gone down completely you, you, you need someone to stick around and um like i've i've tried to make new opportunities for him over the years and so forth because he's an i, I feel like the way that our working relationship was was i was always the one that was blazing a path forward and like what if we tried this what if we tried this what if we, we architected this and he was the one that was like making sure the servers don't, don't go down and making sure that like we have like a deployment process and uh sort of handling cleanup i i think you need one person that is like pushing it forward and another person that's making sure that it's stable enough that like we can still have a game um, and so our, our working relationship was really, really good. Um, and so, yeah, the, the um, just the, the, the sort of aftermath of, of what that was like, um, uh, I tried to build a couple of projects, um, post, um, post the Minecraft server. I, I, th I think I got used to building things so quickly and out of necessity that I never had time to slow down and learn how to, do, how to do things the right way. And so the next couple of projects that I did, um, it was really, 
intentional in terms of I was learning. Okay, I had to make I had to make distributed systems. Um, like if I did it from the scratch the next time, I'm going to design things a lot differently, like I'm a lot more scalable and I'm, I'm going to spend a lot more time in the design phase about like the schema. You know, when you have a MySQL table that's that big, um, things like transactions and joins become really, really expensive. And so I, I think a lot about, you know, the way that the, the data gets sorted and um, security, good Lord. Okay, yes, yeah, so the, the password incident, this one's really funny. Um, and so uh, after I left the project, um, they hired a flurry of people to replace me. That has been like one of the most... Um, uh, like I won't say gratifying, but certainly most flattering things in my life is like how many people does it take to replace William? And the answer was like thirty-five. Um, and uh, thirty-five uh, people replaced you. Yeah, thirty-five people replaced me. Um, there was there was an entire team in Omsk, Russia, that they like rented out in the entire like contracting company. Um, and then like stateside, there was also like twenty people. Um, so it and like on one hand, it was it's actually kind of cool to be responsible for something that ended up in so many people getting jobs, and and, and those people have jobs to this to this day. Like the the, the team is still is still that big, um, and so I, I think even as a teenager, I, I I understood the impact of like um, you're you're literally like making it so that these people have like. Uh, a job that they're going to have a lot of agency. Uh, Amada Lifeboat is the name of the server. Hydrian is the name of the, the parent company. Um, but if if you type in Lifeboat on Google, you'll get like a million a million results. Um, and um, so after they hired all these people to replace me, they sort of had to figure out like how these systems work. And I um, made some questionable architectural decisions um, because of the uh, the speed at which we were developing. Um, so we had sort of the one database server and that was sort of the, like the kingpin of like, well, if this goes down, we're kind of screwed. Um, it also hosted the website. It also hosted the web API. It also hosted the leaderboards. All of the sort of web services that were needed for third party clients to interact with our systems went through this one machine. Um, and we just really focused on making sure this one machine is secure. This one machine is performant and this one machine can scale. Um, the fact that we had a local network really helped because we just prioritized the local network traffic over the external traffic. And if we had to shut down the external traffic at some point, like it'd be okay. Um, you know, uh, if I were building that machine, if, if I were building that service these days, it would certainly not be a one machine. It would certainly not be in one region. It would be, you know, multi-region, like global replicated database, whatever. But th this was the, the one guy. Um, and so that one guy had like a, MySQ, a, a MySQL database running on him and they wanted to set up like a forum for players to talk to each other. And so they installed this, this forum called, um, I think PHP by B, PHP BB, PHP BB or something like that. It was like some forum in a box that you just sort of download. Um, and they installed it on the account server. What's the name of the name of the server? So it was account.lbsg.net. And um, uh, some hacker at some point uploaded a theme to the, they used a vulnerability in that in that forum software to get remote code execution on the server that was running the forum software, which was talking to the same database that had all the account information in it. So they just went ahead and they dumped the entire account information database of 26 million records. Um, and those had emails, they had passwords that were very poorly hashed. Um, I did not know cryptography or security that well when I was 14. I literally just typed into Google, how do you hash a password and you copy and paste the first result I was not thinking. Um, and so I did not know what assaulting was. I did not know um, you know, different algorithms and so forth. It was it was all based off just the functionality of I don't want to store them in plain text, but I want to do the bare minimum above, above that because I have to build the next feature. Um, so um, uh, just a, a quick uh, quick ramp up on how password um, hashing works. Usually you use something called a salt, and a salt is some other piece of information you can tie to that user um, so that when you uh, when when they log in and when you check their password, you uh, pass in as inputs their password that they just typed and the salt. And you should always get the deter a deterministic, like the same result every single time. Um, and the reason you do that is to prevent someone from, if they have access to the database, just going in and dumping all the users that have a certain password because otherwise you can type the bas password basketball and get the hash for it and then look at the table and say, give me all the accounts that have the password basketball and okay, now that you know that their password is basketball. So there was no there was no salting um, that was going on. And so um, at that time, it was the seventh largest breach in the history of the internet in terms of emails and passwords being le leaked. Um, that, was, that was my code. And this is while you were still at the company? Uh, no, this this was like oh, okay. a year and a half after I left, and that was really, really a weird form of responsibility. I'm like, well, it wasn't me that installed the forum software. I would never do that in that same box. It wasn't me that, like, you know, but I still wrote the code that did the password hashing initially, and I didn't think about the implications, and so I I, I felt kind of bad actually at, at, mm -hmm. at the time, but I also 
I was so distanced from the project. It was, it was, it was a, but there were news articles in Wired on CNN on Motherboard, like name your news source of like Minecraft server network leaks 25 million passwords. And it's like, yep, that was, that was me. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was, that was, that was one of the rather funny follow-up follow ups that came from that project. Um, they, they salt their passwords now. Um, I'm, 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 I'm glad about that. Um, Did and... that ever really impact you on like a mental health level? Like I uh, just really admire the resilience of everything you've been through. Oh, my mental health was horrible. Uh, like, really? Uh, like just the amount of responsibility that that project took um, and the, how, big the forces that I was dealing with in terms of like, I, I think that there were times where I wish that it didn't make as much money as it did, because I, I think if it only made like a little bit, then it's like, okay, I can just sort of chill along. I'm making this for people to have fun. It's going to be a little business. It's going to be fine. But like once, um, mostly my dad saw how much money that it could make, it's like, okay, well now, now we want to build this out. Like he was thinking merch lines. He was thinking, you know, do we, you know, start like a, like TV series, or whatever it is. Like, I mean, like trying to figure out like, how do we pivot this into other forms of media? Um, and in terms of Microsoft's involvement, that's actually how I got to this company is after Minecraft or after, after Microsoft acquired Minecraft, um, they invited me. Uh, me and my dad and a couple people from the company out to Redmond to have um, one big dinner. I was sitting down with Matt Booty at the time, who was the um, head of Minecraft, um, and now he's the head of Xbox Game Studios. Um, so it was him, and it was uh, Helen Chong, and it was like a bunch of people that were really high up on the Minecraft team. Um, and I had left the project at that point, but they wanted me to be there just to give inputs. Um, I uh i was pretty excited because even though i left the project i still cared about it and um i wasn't involved in, in the day-to-day -day, but if they came to me and was like hey william if you partnered with minecraft what would you change and i i could answer that off like uh i, I would like a ui that looks, looks exactly like this like you tap on this icon and it shows um these are your stats in terms of like your kills um like these are the games that you can jump to here's like a quick like description of the game um here's like a friends list like you can see what your friends are playing and easily you know like, teleport to them and so forth like from an integration perspective i'm like you should have asked me this question like three years ago because like it would have made this so much more fluid but now that you've asked me like I came with mocks and I came with like a presentation and I came with like, um, it was, it was presenting to the Minecraft team is like, um, if you want to integrate with our server, this is what would be the most helpful. Um, and they were so impressed by that. I was 17 at the time. Um, but they're like, one of them pulled me aside afterwards, his name was John Thornton. And he's like, do you, do you want to, do you want to come work for us? Do you want to, do you want to do, do you want an internship at Microsoft? And I said, hell yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just some kid from the Midwest. Like I, I didn't think it was going to, um, didn't balloon. I, I had certainly hoped, like I, I, I knew I would have to apply for tech jobs at some point, but to have like someone on the inside, that's like, I'm going to make this happen. Um, and he told me, um, so Microsoft has a high school intern program they, they do to this day and they don't hire outside of Washington state for it. And the reason why is because like sometime 20 years ago, Bill Gates hired some guy from out of state for the high school intern program. And it went so poorly that they vowed to never do it again. Um, and so um, he had to go really, really far up the approval chain in Microsoft recruiting and be like, we are going to do this. It is worth it. Like talk to Matt Booty, the VP of Minecraft, um, if you have any questions. And they they somehow made an exception for me. They, they, they somehow got me in there. Um, I was making $15 an hour and having to pay rent in Redmond. So that was basically like a, a like revenue neutral summer for me, but it was the opportunity of being able to work on Mixer, which is their live streaming service um, with a bunch of, uh, it was like a startup that got acquired by, by, by Microsoft. And so there's like the culture was very, um, it was it was a great environment. And um, that's how I got the job that I have today. That's how I'm in Xbox is um, those connections and the Minecraft server. So, yeah. so you got that internship when you were 17, 18? Yeah. 17. And so did you go to college as well uh, and how to, like talk to us a bit about like after that internship college experience and kind of where you are today and uh, final question after that is I just want to do a quick uh, kind of a recap about uh, how you look at it today now and that it's been so many years. Yeah, no, for, for sure, for sure. Um, College, I was obsessed with having a normal college time. I was obsessed with having a couple of close friends and we were going to get drunk and we were going to like um, these speakers that are behind me, the the uh, the mask is on. But um, I was obsessed with like getting better at woodworking and electrical engineering and making side projects and um, 
it was a, I got really into linguistics and to Swedish and to like these different topics that I was interested in. But I, I up until that point, I was running my life at 100% all the time and you don't have enough time to really explore different areas. So um, college for me was really just about expanding the breadth of what I did and um, not not running so much all, 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 all the time. It was, it was, it was a, a much needed break. Um, and sort of helped me find myself as a person because when you pour so much of your energy into this one project and you define yourself by it, um, when you leave it, you have a lot of questions to answer about like, what do I value and how do I want to spend my time and why do I want to spend my time that way? And to this day, I get really antsy if I ever feel like I'm putting too many of my eggs in one basket because I know how that goes. Um, I know that if you put all of your eggs in one basket, you can build something absolutely incredible, but also if and when it goes down, you are absolutely and completely screwed. And so I try to, um, like the side projects that I work on these days that are vastly different from my day job, it's because if something happens in this portion of the tech industry, I want to have, um, that's not the primary reason that I do it, but I, I want to feel like I'm getting my fulfillment from different areas, you know, and I, I want to feel like I'm um, spreading, ac spreading across um, disciplines and so forth in, in that way. Um, in terms of sort of how I reflect on it these days, it is... Um, for, first of all, Alex, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about this project. Um, as, as you know, um, it is not something that I bring up very often. I... I don't tell the story very often because I don't think it's very relatable. I, I don't think that you can enter a lot of conversations at a party and be like, hey guys, any <laughs> anyone play Minecraft or anyone like, you know, like distributed systems? And it's like, I mean, living in Redmond, Washington and being at Microsoft, I have a lot more people that I can talk about the technical intricacies of it with. And it's, it's nice to have people to relate with in that sense. Um, but this is such a unique experience and such a one-off experience that I try to focus more on stuff that I can have in common with, with other people. And so that's why it doesn't get told that often. Um, and it feels almost like a past life at this point. Like I don't, it obviously got me here. And I think that the skills that I built got me here, but it's day to day. It's not something that I think about anymore, which is extremely weird, um, but also extremely cool that um, to have successfully moved on from it. It was something that I was cognizant of at the time. I think that a lot of people build something really great when they're young and then they never live up to it again like they spend the rest of their life reminiscing over you know wasn't it great when i was on the high school basketball team and i scored that one shot you know it's like you you have like your golden era and then you define yourself by that and then you let yourself get stuck in that and i really cognizantly wanted to move on to different things um and so these days i i do a lot of social stuff like i started a lot of events last summer picnics and uh this year i, I, I want to do an egg drop challenge like I, I i try to focus on connecting people because i didn't have that opportunity for a lot of years and i, I want to see, see people um um in a city that's pretty focused on tech i i, I want to see people make make connections and so forth that's that's a, a lot of how i spend my time um i build vehicles um i have a scooter downstairs that i built a lot of the hardware and software for it myself um and uh, the motor controller and the dashboard and the telemetry, telemetry system, like it's a lot of embedded, embedded systems engineering. Um, and I have these little smart watches here. It's on my, uh, my desk. Let me get it. Yeah. This guy right here. Um, it's the Motorola Moto Active. And um, it was sort of a, a rabbit hole of I was uh, figuring out how the scooter dashboard worked. And I'm like, this protocol sucks. It'd be faster for me to just make my own. And then I just started reverse engineering the hardware and software stack of the smartwatch from 2011 because I have 40 of them in my house. I, I bought like an eBay, eBay, eBay auction one time. I'm like, I don't have a use for this right now, but I probably will in the future. And so I, it's all like GPL. So they have to just disclose the source code. So I started like a source tree for it on my computer and I started reverse engineering like the kernel and building kernel modules and fixing the Bluetooth stack. And I do a lot of technical stuff, but it's purely for fun. And it's purely because there's like some problem that I'm trying to solve. Uh, in this case, it's because I wanted like a little, um, a dashboard for my electric scooter that um, it tracks my rides and it does all this cool stuff. So I'm still very much building things. Um, I have some 3D printers in the closet that I um, I do 3D design and I you know, design mounts and brackets and uh, I have motors downstairs and I'm trying to install new sensors on and so forth. So my, my hobby is still very much building things, but it's a lot more physical and it's a lot more at the intersection between software and, and um, hardware stuff these days. Yep. Wow, so William, thank you so much for your time and just your your incredible story um the, the the amount of humility and insightfulness into life that this experience has given you is just tremendous it just sounds like uh until the age of 18 you've 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 done and accomplished so much more than many people in their whole career and it's just incredible and at the same time uh thank you so much for sharing uh your um the challenges you've had as well 
So uh, the, the one and very last question I have for you is, you know, because obviously you've had just such tremendous amount of experience and um, learning opportunities uh, on the positive side, but it also seems like it has had a certain amount of costs for you. Um, the last question is, um, you know, um, if, if you had to do it over again, would you? Alex, I asked myself that question. I asked myself that question daily for years. It's like um, knowing the physical and mental health cost on me and knowing that like, like you can't re rewind the clock uh, when you're a kid. And there's a lot of stuff that when you're a kid, you're sort of allowed to make mistakes and you're allowed to socially be really awkward and you're allowed to put yourself out there. And when you're an adult, you're expected to have a lot more of this stuff figured out. And for a lot of the time post that project, I'm like, man, I built something really impressive um, that like pushed me to my absolute limits and not in a good way. Um, would I undo it if I had the chance? And I flipped back and forth on, on that answer so many times. I'd say when I got the Microsoft internship was when I finally had an answer of like, yes, I would do it again because it resulted in something positive. It's like, this is my long-term career. Um, this is my way of getting out of the Midwest. Um, this is a bunch of people that are passionate about the same gaming stuff that I am that I get to now hang out with and they see me as an equal and that's really freaking cool. Um, and so I, the positives were the long-term and um, that's tough at the time, you know, like post that project, I didn't know that that was going to happen. That happened years later. And I sort of had to work th through all of it, assuming that there wasn't anything long term that was going to come of it. Um, but now that it has, and now that I can look back and I, I feel like, you know, with, um, with hindsight, um, everything gets a bit easier. Everything gets a bit less dramatic. Everything gets, gets a bit, um, less emotional and, uh, and that's nice, but certainly at the time, the, Emotions were very high, um, and it was very it was a very tough time to get through. And I'm glad that I got through it. Um, but it was it was marginal. It was it was marginal if I would have done it again. But these days, I would I would say yes. Didn't expect any any, any less uh, of a thought thoughtful answer from you. So thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes or so, and. Um, I'm sure that all of you are just dying to ask some questions. Um, if if you do, um, you can raise your hand and just uh, you know turn on your camera and just ask if you can and turn on and uh, ask ask questions. Yeah, Rhythm uh, has a question. Yeah. Uh, hey, William. Uh, hey, just really nice uh, listening to your story. Like I feel inspired by it a lot. <laughs> And I found a lot of things relatable to, uh, like when I was in high school, uh, and like a lot of people like were not really into technology. And like I was trying to figure out like Raspberry Pi and like those kind of things mm -hmm. on my own. So it was really nice hearing a story. Uh, so my question is like, like what was your like learning process? Like I know you started like coding at a very young age, um, but like, was there some like teacher, some mentor you had, or like you just started learning on your own, like online? Like what was your uh, process? It was online and that's a mixed bag. I mean, like uh, in the Midwest, there was not really anyone, like just like you were saying with them, like there's not a lot of people that you would know like in your day-to-day -day life that were into tech at the same level that you would want to really learn from them. Um, and I think that's one of the really cool things about the internet is just if you have an idea, you can learn as you go and you can like i was sort of learning distributed systems as i was building the distributed system i was learning like uh, database design as i was building out the database and you get to make mistakes like the database scheme is one of the things that i think of the most is like um, i would do that very very differently next time but to have the real world opportunity to des design it the wrong way and to see the performance like run into the performance bottleneck where, rather than just like having someone tell you you should do it this way and this and usually they don't even tell you like why i mean like at work these days as i'm as i'm sure at microsoft you ask this, ask the senior engineer like you, you show you show them your spec and they're like either it looks good or like you know you should use this and usually they don't they don't actually get to the why but having the opportunity to treat it as like an experimental thing not because that was the intention but because we sort of had to um that helped a lot so like you're more like the hands-on approach, I guess. Absolutely. Like, yeah. 
that's interesting. That's nice. and, that, and that's yeah. to this day too. Like um, with with my vehicles, I remember one time my, my roommate's an electrical engineer, and I've had he's had to bail me out a couple of times. Like one time, I fixed up a motor controller, and I turned it on, and it caught on it caught on fire. And um, he's like, "Your chances of survival are substantially improved by my helping you with this." And I'm like, "Thank you, Han Ming. It's very nice of you." <laughs> um, and once I had designed like a new braking system for it because. Um, for some unknown reason, um, for those of you that are, if, if anyone's into like e-bikes or anything like that, um, you have like a, a brake lever that you use to, to mechanically brake the bike, but you can also run the motor backwards to do uh, regenerative braking and to um, have the motor slow you down. Um, every motor is a generator, every generator is a motor. Um, and um, I had designed this sensor that would tell you how pressed is the brake lever because up until that point, um, every single e-bike brake sensor that I had found on Amazon, on Al Alibaba, all of that, it's just a button, it's just a single button. And a brake isn't a button. Like if, if I am like slightly slowing down because the car in front of me is slowing down, that's a slight slowing down. If I am panic stopping, I am panic stopping. And those are two different amounts of braking that I want for the system. So I designed this little sensor box and a hull sensor and a magnet that you would fit the magnet inside the brake sensor. And the sensor box would communicate with the motor controller and it would tell it like linearly how much should I brake um, uh, along this curve. Um, and so I was telling my, my, my roommate about this and he's like, so how are you going to test it? I'm like, I'm going to go, I'm just going to go down that hill. And he's like, you're just going to go that, go down that hill. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, and so to this day, I'm very much like do it, learn as you're doing it. If you screw up, that sucks, but at least like you, you are bold enough to try it, you know? So, yeah. All right. That's Fantastic. really cool. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank uh, Mark, we have a question from Mark. Uh, yeah. It's an hey, amazing story. Well, oh, hi. Um, <laughs> It, yeah, it reminds me, like Rhythm said, a lot of, you know, I, I identified a lot with what you said, like I of the project um, in, in started during high school that was, you know, had some similar themes. Mm -hmm. um, but my main question was, uh, do you think you could have done it without your, your friend um, helping you through it? We'll have, to, we'll, have to, we'll have to chat about that project sometimes, Mark. I'm 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 curious. I'm uh, that'd, that'd be a, a fun conversation to have. Um, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, he was he was my my best friend up until that point. Um, and and I mean still, uh, it's certainly one of my very close friends. Um, the physical distance hasn't helped much, but um, we would spend hours calling each other and sort of prototyping ideas. Um, I I was designing like e-bikes before those really existed. Of like, what if we you know have this like. <laughs> Thing in the frame and it goes here and the pedal nice. cadence sensor um and so we would we just talk for hours hours a day about our ideas and, it, and that was sort of the f like first time when we took just that friendship and tried to build it into a business thing and i guess in retrospect that was kind of risky I, I feel like in general it's very risky to bring your friends into projects because if and when it goes south like it's going to hurt the friendship too and um i've had a lot of people that have been in spaces that are incredibly prolific that have been like yeah like i started this business with my friends and now we don't talk because like it made money and now we had disagreements and so um thankfully um we were really aligned and sort of what we wanted from the the project and the company and and um he uh, was incredibly competent technically um, and still is. And so um, no issues there, but um, it was, it was uh, Ethan's his name and he was absolutely fundamental. Like it was, it was a tag team effort for sure. Wow. That's, yeah. You're, you're really lucky to be able to go through that with him. Hugely, hugely. Yeah. We, we knew each other since like fifth grade. He was incredibly shy. I remember like our parents forcefully introducing each other because both of us were too shy <laughs> to say anything um, in like the little fifth grade classroom. And um, he liked Minecraft. I like Minecraft. And so it was, that was our bonding. And it turned out we, we did some Minecraft stuff together. So, yeah. Nice, nice. It's wonderful. Thank you for that question, Mark. Um, the next question we have is from Ahmad. Yeah, hi, hi, William. That's very impressive and uh, very inspiring. It uh, sounds like a very long journey and did a lot of learning on the road. Uh, my question would be like more about the challenges. Like, um, if you look back, what is the most challenging technical and non-technical um, challenging that you went through and you would like recommend others to do them differently if they went through the process again? The reason the question I'm asking is that I have all in mind I want to start my own company. I have mm. a lot of tons of idea, tons of idea. And I feel all the time I'm distracted. Like I keep spending time. Oh, this is a good idea. I don't want to mm. trust it. And then I hit kind of like, um, I hit kind of like an obstacle where I feel like I cannot do it my alone, but I need someone else. At the same time, I feel oh, this is more like I can do myself. I, I want to mm. start here to an extent where I feel like maybe I can prototype something. So this is always like this a tire. So picking like one thing. 
Yeah, that's like, like one of the challenges like I'm going through, but maybe there's more to it from your perspective. No, that's that, that's a good question. I, I understand what you're asking. I feel like um, uh, in terms of technical challenge, I think a lot of people get caught up in trying to learn the best technology and trying to like, I'm going to build a, a, a web app. So therefore I have to learn React and I have to learn Vue and I have to learn, learn Angular and I have to learn like whatever new framework of the week is is, is currently popular. Um, and on the server side, like I have to make microservices and I have to like, they spend a lot of time on the frameworks and the tools. Um, mm -hmm. In reality, I would say the tools really don't matter, and it is what you are, what you feel most comfortable in. I think you should try a couple of programming languages and frameworks that have vastly different opinions. Like um, I'd say, um, when it comes to just not front-end programming but back-end programming, JavaScript is extraordinarily loose. Um, there's no types. There's no. It's just vibes, and the, they're very loose API contracts. Um, the nice thing about JavaScript is you can build apps really, really quickly. Um, it's not going to scale, um, like, it, but sometimes you don't need to solve that problem. And I think that's what um, I think that's part of why we could build out this project as fast as we did and then scale it as high as we did is because we didn't over engineer the things that didn't need to be over engineered. Like, if we mm -hmm. did like a feature freeze and we said like you know for three months we are going to improve the the server code base to make it uh, more efficient and stuff like that. Would that be awesome? Yeah, but we didn't have the luxury of that time. We had to keep shipping features. We had to keep shipping new game types. We had to stay on top of this sort of news cycle of like wanting to be the most exciting. When you're number one, you got to defend against all the up and coming people. And so like some other server partner would come up with some hot new game type and we, we have to counter that with something of our own. Um, so we were so focused on the features that the technical part sort of faded away. And I would recommend that as a, if you're just building stuff on your own with like a small group of people, you have much greater impact by focusing on the the what and not the how, um, if if that makes sense. That's like the biggest the biggest advice that I would give. All right, okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Dan. And also I'll say like these decisions, you're gonna look back after you finish like a major project and you're gonna be like, wow, that really technically constrained me. Like I really was fighting against that decision every single day from the day that I did it. And that's okay. And I think it's I think if you're critically analyzing anything that you make, you're going to have a list of like, um, this is what I would do differently next time. That that is a good thing. That is that shows that you are being bold enough in your design to learn new things. It shows that you're paying enough attention to recognize how that design is limiting you. And it shows that like on your next project going forward, you know that you're gonna do a better job because of that feedback loop that you have. With yourself and, and that is the key it, it is way less the day-to-day -day of, of like the the implementation of the thing and it's way more like are you progressing as a developer from project to project because you don't have to go back and rework everything all the time it's just you hop to the next idea you hop to the next idea and every time it should be getting easier to maintain it should be faster to build it should be faster to perform and so forth um you, you can you can see that trend and that's like a really satisfying thing i think not just with development but with any craft i mean if you're making if, if it's woodworking and you notice some like first project to next project and it's like wow this went so much faster and so much smoother and i feel so much better about the end product um that's a, a really satisfying and gratifying feeling for sure i did yeah thanks happy to so it looks like uh we don't have any other oh we had we have one more uh one more question let's uh let's let's go with uh connor uh, yeah, thanks again, William, for coming and uh, doing this interview. I found your story really inspiring, not just um, because of all the challenges that you faced and went through, but also it seems like you were very human about it. Like you took the time at the end to kind of reflect on what you had done, what you had learned. And uh, I know you mentioned when you went off to college, uh, you really focused on kind of like broadening your horizons and being introspective so you could kind of learn about yourself, what you want to do for the rest of your career, mm. and, you know, maybe just things you're interested in. And so I was wondering, uh, what were some of the biggest things that you learned about yourself, like, since then? And how has that kind of transformed, like, your goals for the future? Dang, Connor, that is a really deep question, and I really, I really appreciate it. Um, I would say... Um, I had, uh, with the Minecraft server, I was lucky in that I had a friend group that I could still go to um, that didn't require maintenance in terms of a, a lot of time in terms of maintenance. Um, we sort of, we had this 
honors program of sorts for school that lasted like five years that we were together and we, we followed each other from class to class. And so we, so we spent a lot of time with each, with each other then so I could sort of fall back on that friend group. But then in college, I found that you have to work a lot more at making friends. You have to work a lot more at putting yourself out there and um, finding spaces where you can belong and so forth. And it, it's not, it's not going to happen near, nearly as naturally. Um, and so I had to spend a lot of time sort of figuring out what am I about outside of tech and outside of work um, when you spend 80% of your time coding for you know this many years like you don't have a lot of time for to say like um, how do I want to treat other people and like how do I want them to treat me I think it's really important to sort of define expectations for yourself but also on other people it's like you know i don't have to keep you as a friend because you keep treating me this way and that type of thing like i i have i feel comfortable enough in my own skin and my ability to keep making friends and i'm going to demand a certain level of respect and if you stab me in the back i'm not going to keep 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 associating with you and so forth like i feel like um sort of defining this contract and defining this box as like you know this is what i want myself to be um and it's not static you know i, I think covid really did a number on a lot of us socially and did a lot of uh, just that was that was tough for everyone to get through um and these days um like there's some people on this call like um, mark uh helps operate this board game group that i think is just fantastic like every single sunday we go and we just play um board games and i've met so many people through that rhythm through, through that as well um that i think it's just a really cool social space and i've read um some books like a uh, bowling alone by robert robert putnam's a really good one talking about sort of the decline in the social fabric that started in the 1970s and it started with people moving to the suburbs and it, it's continued ever since and i feel like in the age of the internet we are more and more we spend a lot of time with ourselves and we spend a lot of our time with you know, people online but it's harder to make these in-person connections and so i'd say I found out um, through that time and through COVID that I'm really passionate about making spaces where people can um, bond over some activity. You know, it's it's hard to do it in a vacuum. It's it's hard if you do, if you don't know if you have something in common with something someone. Mm -hmm. But if you make a space where you can do a particular thing, then you find out how much you have in common with other people, and you can sort of build out your social network that way. And so that's um, that's something that I found that I'm really passionate about and completely non technical in nature. You know, I think it also sounds uh, really human as well like interaction with others. And thanks for sharing, uh, William. Thank you for the question. I, I think it's one of the most valuable things we can do um, with our time here. And um, at least living in Seattle, people are really awkward because we're all nerds. And so, but I think at some point I had this realization of like, wait, people are really awkward. That means that like, I can do it. And and I, I wasn't good at it initially at, at all. Um, and I, I learned a lot, like the first couple of events that I hosted about, you know, people are going to flake out and that's okay. And people are going to try to take the group off task and that's okay. And like, you have to sort of learn to navigate these situations. But um, I think that's sort of just the way that I live my life. I think a lot of people focus on doing the thing perfectly and they're going to, you know, sit down and overanalyze and then think for a long time. I am way more like, let's just do the thing and then we'll sort of make course corrections as we go and we'll, we'll get there. And, and that's really worked socially too. Um, yep. Uh, thanks for uh, answering the question. I also, uh, it's a quick tidbit, but I actually played that uh, Minecraft uh, Hunger Games a few times. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm I'm really glad. Like, I was at a dinner the other day, too, where, like, uh, someone was like, wait, what was the server name? I'm like, Lifeboat. And they're like, I played that. That was my childhood. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's so weird to me to be, like, you know, people telling me that, like, hey, I, I and, and I, I don't know if you play on the particular server or the particular implementation, but I've met tons of people that, like, when I tell the story, they, like, they um, they played on it back in the day, which I find very funny and, and cool. I um, I have my cousin. He's uh, just turned at six years old, and uh, so his dad he got him like Minecraft on Nintendo, and he loves it so much. He watches the video on YouTube all the time, and yep. like it started worrying his dad and worrying his mom because he's spending too much. He's so into it. So he mm -hmm. was just like he had a lot of curiosity questions, and he once came to me like we haven't met like. We met the first time when he was six years old, so I haven't met him. So he asked me, "What did, what do you do? What, what do you do for work?" I didn't like. Uh, I'm a I'm a computer engineer. What, he he kept questioning that. What is that? I'm like, I don't want like software engineer, something like that. What is that? So I didn't you see that game. We built something mm -hmm. like that, and he did not stop asking me to do things for him. 
to make it different. <laughs> he has a lot of ideas. And I keep him like keep like going about how the game works and, and, and I have literally have zero idea what he's talking about. Like he wants to fly in a different position, he wants to grab things and move them away in a different way. I I, I couldn't like comprehend what he wants, but it sounds so so interesting to, to him. So it's, and, and it's a funny story. It's really cool about that game is it inspires the players to think about like, how would I change this? How would I make my own mark on this? And that is what inspires a lot of people to learn programming. I have met a lot of people that got started programming because of Minecraft. It's because they made an environment where it is rewarding to modify the space around you. Um, Roblox is another, another another really popular sandbox game where people start out and they build these, you know, multi hundred thousand user experiences. It's just... Um, it's a very different world to the corporate, you know, we we're, we're planning this for years when it's a bunch of kids and they're moving at light speed and they're trying everything. Um, it's, it's, it's cool to see sort of like both extremes um, and find out like, where do you and your strengths fit, fit on that continuum. So, yeah. Great. Thank you for that uh, fantastic uh, question, Connor. Um, and uh, here we are coming to an end. So I want to thank William for being here with us and just for being so open and just sharing this. One of the most incredible stories I've ever heard to this day. Thank you so much. And um, I guess we'll end it here. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for your insightful questions and for listening. Really enjoy that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.